right. Welcome to another episode of Homestead Shop Talk Podcast with Al from Lemon Anchors, Ben from Holler Homestead, and myself, Jason from Sow the Land. This is episode 50, which two more guys, and we've made it a year every Friday. That's crazy. I know. I don't know That's when insane. we're ever going to get together in, in person, but right. I don't know. <laughs> I want to know how many people have been listening to the podcast since the beginning. Yes. Raise your hand. <laughs> I know my mom has. That'd be interesting. <laughs> Hi, mom. Yeah. Thanks, cool. Ben's mom. Yes. <laughs> so today we're uh, going to be talking about our week, see if anything we got going on. I know we're all, this is the busy time of year for everyone, I think. Jason, why don't you go first? We made you wait till last, last time. Okay. So um, jumping off of uh, last week's uh, worst homestead job. <laughs> um. I just did the worst homestead job today. Uh oh. Can we guess? What? Can you guys guess? What did you, it involve? It did it involve manure? <laughs> uh, there was some manure, I guess. <laughs> hmm. We said it in the last podcast. What was the worst one? Well, you don't got a stationary chicken coop. <laughs> no, but I have little tiny pigs. <laughs> Male uh, pigs. Yes, that needed to be castrated. The, uh, the oh. snippy snippy. Nobody, nobody enjoys that job. Yes. Yeah. So he did poop some while we were doing it. <laughs> so now do you wear the... earplugs when you're doing it? No, 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 you just cannot be, you know, it's hard to not like want to hurt, you know, you kind of want to kind of want to, you're just annoyed. Like you want to hurry and just be like, yeah, let's yeah. just get it done. Let's get it done. But then you don't want to make mistakes. So, you know, I first thought I was like, um, you know, I should call Ben over and he could help me. I was like, he's done it before. But then I thought, well, you know what? We have a friend, Brian, that has some coonies. And I know he's trying to breed his coonies. And, I, and I'm pretty sure he has never castrated. So I was like, I'm going to call Brian since he's never done it before. <laughs> and uh, he came over this morning and we did it. Uh, we just had one male pig. So that wasn't too bad. Um, oh, that's not too and, bad. And we did it. Yeah. So. I mean, everything went fine. He seems to be doing fine out there. Um, and uh, it wasn't too bad, but yeah, not the best morning. Um, For you or the pig. <laughs> right. I know. It's just something I was dreading. Um, How old are they or are they? Two and a half, almost two and a half months. Two and a half months. Yep. So they're, they're getting bigger. They're getting, they're, they're starting to wean themselves off. Um, now they're eating, they're kind of nursing still, but they're also eating the feed. So they're getting nice and fat. It's always nice when they start um, eating the feed. Cause then they, uh, they start gaining weight real fast. The only problem is feeding yeah, you that many more mouths. Big. Yeah. And they're all kind of fighting for the feed. So it's that kind of like weird transition of like, you know, I ended up selling, they haven't picked them up yet, but I ended up selling two of them. So. You know, once they pick them up and then, you know, there won't be so many fighting going on. <laughs> or I would, you know, I, I might separate them. I don't know. So, yeah, there was that this morning. And also, you know, I filmed it. And then I went to go look at the footage today. And uh, my mic was not all the way in the camera. Oh, so the, the, the sound was kind of spotty. There was some... There was a lot of moments where there was no sound at all, and then the sound pops in and then out. So I'm like, ah, oh, geez. I was like, what is going on? Yeah, I looked at my camera after I, I was uploading the footage, and then I was like, I looked at my camera. I was like, it was the mic jack was out, out a little bit. Yep. And I was like, darn it. So now I got to think of some creative way to post <laughs> it, or maybe I just don't post it. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's castrating so it's not like you know the most uh funnest video <laughs> yeah that's or it the, could uh, be it could be the, I don't know. the struggle of trying to film you know you can't really go back and refilm that video yeah i know i know i know i was like yeah. oh, let's do it over <laughs> so i don't know we'll see how it goes i might post it i might not but you have to do like a voiceover yeah or some music and yeah i might just mention it or something i don't know were you planning on making a whole video about it, or was it just going to be like an add-on in a video, kind of, or part of a video? 
Yeah, I was going to make it like my day. Yep. Like this is what I did today. The video. Um, <clears throat> I did that last year with it. And that that video actually did pretty good. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the cash trading videos are, are people watch those. <laughs> I mean, I'm not graphic or nothing, but you right. know, it's, it's probably because it's different and it's, you know, they're little pigs, but it is part of it. Yeah. It's trying to be, you know, real and honest about it, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. But so we did that today. What else? Uh, I just picked up some feed this week. Hopefully that might be close to it for the rest of the year. Hopefully, um, 2000 pounds of broiler feed and a thousand pounds of turkey feed. Wow. So a lot of my feed. turkeys have to all live. <laughs> yeah mm. my turkeys need to all live so they could eat that feed all uh, right we have uh we lost three turkeys so far how many did you order 20 20 so it's only been two weeks and they all seem to be doing fine i don't know they look healthy but we'll see that's, I, that's I figured, turkeys well, yeah i figured if say half of them die then you know i'll just feed that feed to my chickens uh pigs would eat it you know it's not gonna go to waste but it's just a lot of feed Um, that is a lot of feed so i just got my drip tape in for my high tunnel i haven't started that yet probably tomorrow hopefully i wish it would have came in sooner because it was a lot cooler out but (laughs) man you can only do sprinklers when it's a million degrees outside i know in the high tunnel (laughs) so yeah i've been waiting on that and then while i'm waiting on that i've been i've been trying to organize stuff like usually if there's like downtime i'm like organizing you know like in my little barn i hung up all my uh all the nettings that we use that we're not using currently you know just put some big hooks out there and just hung them so they're not on the floor uh even in my big barn i cleared out a stall of you know i'm already trying to plan of like where to put tools and stuff like that because there, there's still stuff in my big barn that we've when we first moved two and a half years ago that they're still sitting there you know you kind of just move and you just put stuff like let's just move let's just get in and you're just throwing stuff in places and they're st- still sitting there so i was like man i need to like figure it out and throw stuff away that i'm not using so i've been trying to figure that out and i cleared out a stall of of where i may build a uh walk-in cooler i kind of want to have that cleared out so that way i don't know i could look at it (laughs) empty (laughs) and figure out how i want to do that and keep it empty so that way i'm not used to having it with stuff in it but that might not be i don't know when that'll be but i think we need to get our kitchen renovated first before that because lorraine was like well, you did your fencing, so next winter it's the kitchen. I was like, "All right, man, all right, you're right." <laughs> do do the if it wasn't for preserving season, I'd say do the kitchen now. That way, you can do it in the air conditioning while it's hot outside. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that'd be tough. We'd have to make a makeshift. Yeah, it would depend on how fast I could like gut it and then put it back. Sounds like a challenge. I'd have to be really, I'd really have to, yeah, I have to really plan <laughs> it, you know? I'd have to have buy the stuff and like really do it like that. So I don't know. Or build the outdoor kitchen first and then. I have faith in you. I think you could do all it. the content. Yeah. People would love that. People <laughs> love the urgency with building. Yeah. No, I know. So, yeah, I don't know. That's something I have to think about. But let's see. Other than that, man, yeah, we're still, you know, we're up to our ears in cabbage still. Like, the, I think the pigs are sick of it now. <laughs> They're like, oh, cabbage again. We've been feeding them a ca- ton of cabbage, which is cool. So uh, Lorraine gave us some of, that, some of that cabbage. We have also been eating the heck out of that yep. cabbage. That cabbage is really good, by the way. <laughs> Just wanted to say, like, it's really good cabbage. Uh, I yeah. think we ate it every day last week. I think she gave it to us on Tuesday. And we had it in every meal for like, I don't know, until Saturday. So yeah, it went to good use. Yeah. No, that's good. What Super variety did you, did you grow? Uh, Napa cabbage, uh, red cabbage, um, and just like a regular green. I don't know yeah. specific name, but 
the Napa cabbage grew a lot fast. That grew in our high tunnel, which it, that was the first to first to harvest. And then we still have cabbage out there that not quite ready, but the bugs are starting to eat it. Yep. So we've just been kind of picking stuff off of it and feeding it to our pigs and even the chickens too. And I would like to ask, like, what's your secret? We have tried to grow Napa cabbage for like three years and it never gets above like three inches tall before we get completely overrun with flea beetles. Like never knew what a flea beetle was until we moved to North Carolina and they, they skeletonize the entire Napa cabbage. Yeah. We haven't had luck either. Like in the past, this is probably like our best harvest that we've ever had in, uh, I don't know if it was because maybe it's a new area that we haven't really planted in, you know, uh, or be. maybe because it was in, in the high tunnel. I don't, you know, nothing, we haven't grown a garden in there. You know, maybe the first time you've grown in there, the, the bugs haven't found that area yet. <laughs> so th that could be it. Um, Did you maybe? start it any earlier than normal? Or do you guys normally start your cabbage that early? No, I mean, we started the seeds indoors. Um, at first before, you know, it was before I had finished the high tunnel and then we brought them out as I finished. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe the soil that we, that we purchased, I mean, maybe that has something to do with it, but I think it's just maybe a new area. Um, cause everything in that high tunnel that we have is like growing really good. And I don't know if it's just, cause I thought we thought maybe it would have been too hot for the cabbage and they, they wouldn't really do anything or, or they would grow too fast or something. But, um, that hasn't been the case. It means you got some good soil. Maybe that was it. I don't know. I, I'm glad it is, man. We paid a lot of money for that soil. <laughs> <laughs> Moving it. Mm. I mean, geez. I'm super thankful for that. Yeah, you got a lot of time shoveling all that compost to the greenhouse, too. Oh, yeah. That was a lot of time and money right there, man. Yep. But So it's been worth it, for sure. Now it's paying you back in cabbage. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, everything else seems to be growing. And um, we've got tomatoes are, are started already. They're, they're still green, but they're, they're there. So yeah, hopefully, I think uh, putting that drip tape is going to help a lot too. But yeah, I think that's yeah, that's all I have for this week. How about you, Al? You got um, you got anything growing yet? Yeah, this Gina's week? been, we got the garden going. We did raised beds. We got lettuce that we should probably start to eat this week. Tomatoes are in. The only thing we haven't got planted yet is squash, like summer squash, zucchini, and then we got we haven't got our winter squash in the ground yet. We got to work on another another spot for that. So hopefully this week we'll get those planted. But last weekend was like the first real weekend to plant the garden for us in our area. So mm. and then it got down to what night was it? Monday night, Tuesday night. It got down to thirty eight degrees. There was a frost advisory. So man, I, like it was cold here. You text us how <laughs> cold it was. I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Like I woke up and we left all the doors and windows open that night, and it was like, "Ooh, it's kind of chilly." <laughs> and you you text me and said, "Hey, it's thirty thirty eight. What's it for you guys?" It was like, "Man, forty forty seven is a lot warmer than thirty eight or whatever." That was nice. Yeah, we've had a lot of like low forties in the morning this last week it's like yeah i like this wake up we got the windows open and it's cold it's like yeah this feels good yep it was you know, a cool been in the last upper week. 70s lower 80s it's about what it was here just perfectly pleasant it feels like april weather april weather <laughs> <laughs> we april haven't had any us. humidity which has been nice for us it's been dry that's funny so what else we, you get into al why don't you we go? got the pond stocked we usually do that we try to do it once a year. We go fishing, and then we have friends that come over, and then I know we have critters that go up there and eat them because every once in a while we'll find like a pile of fish bones on the edge, and we'll see the old, what are those, the, the blue herons? We'll see the blue herons flying around. It's like, oh, man, that's my fish. That's not supposed to be yours. <laughs> what kind of fish are you putting in there? We put trout. Hmm. So how, we like did. How, like how many, like is it pounds that you order? Or how does that work? No, it's by, so we do them, so we got 50 fish. Once a year, our local Agway, or actually local-ish Agway does a, a pond stocking thing, 
and they have a fish hatchery that's not that close, but the fish hatchery will come up to our area and stock the pond. So I think we paid, so we got 50 fish. I think it was like 200 bucks. They come deliver them and put them in your pond and they were like 10 to 12 inches long. Oh, that's a good size. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. This year we did rainbows. Last year we did brook trouts. They were supposed to be like 12 inches. And they had sold out of them or something, so they brought up like eight inches, but they gave us like double the amount. So we have quite a quite an assortment in there. But and was this a this is a pond that was on your property already, or did you do that? No, it was a pond that was already here. It's it's like got like two or three springs that feed it. So did it have fish in there already? When you nope. Okay. No, I think the people who so we bought the property from the second owner. Or I don't know, like they bought it off somebody who logged it. And I think the logger who logged it, he put a road in and I think he made the pond. I think he dug the pond to get the gravel out of it to make the road. And then he fed it with a couple of springs. And there's another pond that doesn't have any fish in it that we found either. But it's the first pond, we call it, the one we put the trout in. It's always full. It's always running over. It's got an overflow and it's like cold spring water. So like, okay, that'll hold trout. But there's no other hatcheries in our area that grow or raise any other fish. Like I asked this guy, I'm like, oh, do you do like bass or catfish? He was like, nope. He's like, they'll rebreed and you don't have to come back to us. Trout won't breed in a pond because they need a sandy bottom. And most ponds don't have a sandy bottom. He's like, so every year, every couple of years, we get repeat customers coming back <laughs> and buying trout, where if we do other fish, we don't have repeat customers. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's just what business. Say? They sell 100,000 fish. Yep, it is. They sell 100,000 trout a year. That's quite a wow. few fish. So have you been fishing in that pond and got some? Yeah, so we, this year, we we waited a day, and since we did the so we this is what the third or fourth time stocking it. So like last year we did the brook trout. So if we were catching anything, we were going for the bigger rainbows because we did rainbows this year or brook trout, and they were smaller. And then we have a smoker, so we did some candied smoked trout. That was fun. Been wanting to do that for a while now. How big are the ones you getting? Like when you when you catch them? The rainbows were probably I would say. 15 inches and they're probably like three or four inches wide at the widest spot that's a good size yeah that's cool do you feed them yeah they were decent the brookies we kept them no the first year we tried and they wouldn't eat it we got you know whatever pelletized fish food is and it just sat there in the pond we go up there and we'll see them jumping all the time eating bugs and then we see tadpoles so i'm assuming they eat tadpoles and then the first year we stocked was the year we built the dock. And when we were building the dock, we saw crawfish everywhere. And I haven't seen the crawfish like I did that year. So I'm assuming the trout eat the crawfish too. <laughs> <laughs> but Probably. Can't blame them. Yeah, no. But it's kind of cool to have that. Like you just, you go up there. We don't go fishing when we want, but even if we're not fishing, you can usually walk around see a trout swimming or see one jumping up and eating bugs. So it's like, that's cool. And you don't got to do anything to them. Right. Yeah, It'd be nice be if they would reproduce. Yeah, it would. So you just can't find another company that. Does... I've searched, I've searched high and low. And as of right now, I haven't found anybody because I'd like to get catfish and catfish will repopulate themselves. So our other pond, I've never seen an inlet. So it must be dug on a spring because it's never, it's gone down a little bit, but not much. But I've never found an overflow. It always stays like stagnant. Like it's always the same, whether the, the years of drought or not, it just stays. So I'm like, I see. So I think it'd be perfect for catfish. I don't think the trout would live in there. But we tried candied trout smoking them. So if anybody has a good recipe out there for different smoked fish, let me know because we've tried a few. But this was decent, but it wasn't great. I think I'd have to, we did a wet brine. So I don't know if I'd have to just up the, like the maple syrup and the brown sugar in the brine or try like a dry brine. But the wet brine was the easiest because you could just let it sit for 24 hours where the dry brines, it was like, oh, 12 hours or something like that. So it wasn't as convenient to do a dry brine as it was a wet one. Sounds kind of like something Meg used to make all the time. Uh, 
it's called Gravlox. It's just cured salmon. Uh, she was doing that. I mean, yep. 10 years ago, long time ago, we were in California. Uh, she'd get some salmon, get a good piece of salmon and then cover it in brown sugar. It was like brown sugar, salt and dill. And then she, you know, you just flip it every day. And then after, I don't know, a couple of days, it's cured. And it completely changes the way it looks. It looks like like a chunk of candy or something like that. Right. But yeah, it sounds sounds similar. Would you smoke yours? Or... No, I believe Gravlox is unsmoked. It's unsmoked. Interesting. So I woke up the other morning to our cows out. Or should I say, Uh-oh. I saw Miles out. And I was like, yeah, that's weird. Like, all right. So it, it wakes you up pretty quick when you see your cows out first thing in the morning. But I'm like. He's out, no big deal. Like, they come to grain. So we grain them. Not a lot, like twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. We'll go out there with, they might each get like a cup of grain. Just so they'll be like, they'll know grain and they'll come to it. And we make it a friendly list. We'll brush them and stuff like that. So like, no big deal. They love their grain. So I go out, get the grain. I see Miles, haul it to him. He starts walking over. I go get grain. I put a halter on him, then I brought him back into the pasture. I was like, all right, now I got to find George. Where's George? So I got on the side by side because I couldn't find him anywhere. Drove down almost to the bottom of the property, nowhere in sight. Drove up past the workshop in the big barn, couldn't find him. I'm like, well, that's weird. So I got, so we, we usually, we got the barn for them. It's like a shed. And then we have like a pasture that's fenced in. It's probably, what's that one? That one's like 50 by 100. And then we let them, been letting them out on pasture in a single strand fence. So we, I'm like, oh, the fence is down. Well, I followed the fence because I couldn't find them. Well, there we have our pasture. And then there's a drop off. He must have went chasing something and he died. He what? Ran off, yeah, he ran off the wall and, must, and broke his neck. Oh bummer! So my, like I'm looking for the cow, like hollering for him. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to go in the woods and find him. And then I look down, and he's there, and his head's like wrapped around backwards. I'm like, oh, what the heck? The weird thing was when I was out looking for him, I just saw one goose fly over, make a bunch of noise, and then while all this was going on, Gina was like. Is George lose too? Because she heard the side by side going down the road. And I'm like, yep. So I, I didn't tell her I found him. So she came out and she's starting to look for him or she was going to. So then I told her, but she said when she first came out of the house, the lone goose was in the pasture and scared the bejesus out of her, making a bunch of commotion. So then later on, we saw the lone goose like right near the barn and it was like 10, 20 feet from us squawking. And then it got up and flew and took off. So the area where George was, or the area he went off, it's like, I don't know, it's, we have our pasture, and then there's a big rock, and then it goes down to like another level. So like that area right there, he just, I'm assuming he charged the goose, because the pasture here was all flattened out, and then he ran this way. So I don't know if the goose scared him, or if he scared the goose, but there was a fence up, so he wasn't like in, or couldn't go to both pastures. Does that make sense? He was it was a yeah. divider and they don't bother the fence. So I have no idea what happened. But uh, was George the bull was or the steer? Drop off there? George was the bull, and we had just found out not even a week before that that he's A two A two or was A two A two. Oh man. Man. Yeah. Is that I'm the sorry, one that got? sucks. Yeah, we just got him we had him. Yeah, it did. <laughs> we had him for like five weeks. So we had him. It feels like we had him longer because we, I'm trying to think, we went and looked at him and we put a deposit on him this winter. And then she was, they were holding him and halter training him. And then we, we were waiting to go get him until their road dried up because we had like three or four different mud seasons this winter. And they live on a, like a couple miles up on a dirt road and it was super muddy. So it seems like we had him longer in my head just because like we, we've been kind of like had this plan all lined up and, you know, knew we were getting him and had a deposit on him. So when we looked at him, like we only had him five weeks, it feels like it was a lot longer than five weeks. But 
yeah, he was the bull. We were, you know, every morning me and Gina would go out at night, me and Olivia go out and do the chores. So each twice a day, one of us would be out brushing and feeding the cow. And then, you know, he got to know us by name. Like we'd go out, we holler to him if they were out in pasture. He'd just come moseying through the alleyway, put his head around the barn, like look at us, come in. And so I was like, oh, dang. Not so something you're expecting to find, that's for sure. No, no. Wow. What a bummer, So I man. Called, tried calling you that day, Ben. That was the morning I tried calling you. Um, I was like, well, you know what? I, can, I didn't save his meat because it happened sometime early evening, I think, because we were gone. With, we went to a friend's house for like a couple of hours. And then when we came back, we never saw him. I'm like, oh, they're out sleeping in pasture somewhere. We won't bother him. So they were blow. He was bloated that morning. So I was like, I'm not gonna bother trying to save the meat. Um, but I was like, oh, he has horns, so I'll I'll cut his head off and I'll save his skull. So I called was calling you to see how you do that. You did that, like what you did the, the process to do all that, so you can get all Man. the hide and everything off. Well, what what I day to, was that? When I went to go get him over, what day? Let's see. Was that? It was. It was Wednesday. You know, I saw that call and I was going to call you back. I don't even, I completely spaced that. <laughs> no, you texted me back, but. Did I? So when I went to go bury him, yeah, I went to go bury him. His horn was broken. Oh, man. So that's how hard he hit. So I'm assuming that's, I'm like, okay, that's what happened. He must have ran or walked, ran, whatever, and then fell off and then landed head first, landed on his horn. And then broke his neck. That's my guess. You think something like that could have been, I mean, I know freak accidents, but could it be prevented somehow? Like, I don't know, put a fence there or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I think if you, I think if you were, you'd have to have like a heavy duty fence there to prevent that. If but super freak, like we talked to the lady we got him from and she was like, wow, that's a freak accident. And then later on, I was talking to her. She's like, well, you know, we have had cows get struck by lightning before. Wow. That's and then a freak accident. They've had cow. They had a cow. Yeah. Well, she didn't think that was a freak accident. Like, she wasn't. She was just like, yeah, we've had cows it's struck by lightning. Like, that was no big deal. Or that wasn't freak. But she was like, my husband went to the, the farm one time. And there was a tree with a crotch like this. And the cow stuck its head in. And instead of lifting its head out of the crotch, it just stayed there and hung itself. Wow. <laughs> so, Man. Yeah. So it was definitely a rough week. And I would I wouldn't say like if like this was like the worst thing I think that's ever happened to us homesteading. Like if we were gonna quit, it would this would have been like the time where I would have been like, Yeah, I'm done. If we didn't have like a good reason why we're doing everything. I'm like, let's just sell everything, get out like this, <laughs> let's just do something else. Like I'm done. That that was like the gut feeling. I'm like yeah. I was sick to my stomach for like three or four days. And I was just yeah. like, I'm done. Like, if it wasn't the, you know, if we weren't doing it for the good quality of food, the lifestyle, like, I would just check out and we would have been like, okay, sell everything. We're going somewhere else. I don't know what we're doing, but we're not doing this no more. I had those same thoughts when our two sheep died. I believe it because my, <laughs> when I saw him, my heart sunk. And that's all I could think of. I'm like, oh my gosh, Jason just dealt with this too. I'm like, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. Like, At least it wasn't we both just stick of them. with chickens, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, that's true. Yeah, what if they didn't? Yeah, he didn't follow that one, you know. Right, and they're oh, so man. they're so mellow. Like when they walk, they're just like, oof. like, yeah. I mean, the slow black motion. one. What's that? Slow motion. Slow motion. The black one, which is Miles, the one we still have. Like he'll every once in a while he'll get like a buck and bronco. Like he'll get excited and you'll see him like being like a buck and bronco like kicking and spinning and stuff for a second but like i've never seen him like run normally it's like just slow motion walking all the time man but they do also say that they are like guard animals and they will kill coyotes and stuff like that so i don't know if the goose spooked him or maybe if the goose spooked him and then he was trying to protect protect it or if the goose was protecting something i don't know or maybe it had nothing to do with the goose is that your goose? No, it was just a wild goose we oh. saw. Her. So I, we haven't seen it since. Oh my gosh! So I have no. So the Grim Reaper goose, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh! I know. But 
it's it's so hard to have like cameras on all your animals like that. Yep. Or in every part of your land, you know. Yep. Yeah, I had the camera with me because so I'm like, well, you know, the he they're out, no big deal. So I'm like, I'll grab the camera, I'll go outside, I'll get them in. And mm-hmm. it's just like, oh, yeah, saw him and my heart just sank. Are you gonna make a video about it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We did. Not, I mean, nothing. I mean, I shared what, like, in the moment, like, basically yeah. everything that was in the moment. I didn't show them. And then after that, I just, I'm like, I'm done. I had to bury him, do all the things. I had to recover him first because he was down that bankman. It wasn't bad, but it had just rained the night before. So the way you can go to get it with the tractor was muddy. So I had to set up on the bank and then use the excavator, pull him up with a, like, a rope. So it's kind of like, first of all, that happens. Then you got to deal with, recovering them and then you got to dig a hole i mean i'm thankful i had the excavator and the equipment to do everything but yeah yeah Yeah. that's a big animal yep yeah damn it's a big hole oh sorry about that man yeah it was and the funny thing like it's it's not funny but like what do you say like everybody's response is like that sucks which it is and then it's like that's farming and it is but it sucks yeah (laughs) you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. and that then on the it same thing, you got to kind of expect to you. it, yeah. right? I shouldn't say you have to expect it, but I guess it's one of those things that you have to kind of like learn to deal with somehow or another. Because it it shook us for at least three to five days. Yeah, so if you have livestock, you've got dead stock. Yep, I know those things happen. I guess. Yep. So like we got him because we want to breed him to our jersey. So we were hoping he was a two a two. We had him. We had. Didn't have them tested before we bought them because everybody, nobody wants to wait to get the genetic test back because it can take over a month. So we had just found out that he was A2A2. So the plan was whether he was A2A2 or not, we would breed him to the Jersey. But if he wasn't A2A2, it would just be for beef. If he was A2A2, we'd be able to sell, either keep the offsprings that are heifers or sell them. But then we also want to get into raising beef so we can raise and sell good quality grass-fed meat, you know, because, like, I know I personally can only eat grass-fed meat. If I eat grain-fed beef, my body knows it, and I, I, I'm I, like, I don't want to say, I don't know if I'm allergic to it or what, so it's like, I want we want to get into raising good quality food for us and for others. So when that happened, it was like, oh, what a blow. But then on the same hand, it's like, if we didn't have, why we want to do this, we would we would have checked out, I'm sure. I would have been like, that's it. Put it on the market. We're selling. I don't know where we're going, but <laughs> Yeah. So so how many so what do you have now? So right now we have the Jersey, which is the milker cow, Azalea. We got her calf, which is a year old. We have um Miles, which is a year old. He's the black pylon cattle. And then we have we may or may not have more cows coming shortly <laughs> that we had planned on having anyways. And now we, so now we got to see if we, if we want to get another bull, if we can find one that's A2, A2, or if we just want to maybe learn how to AI and go the AI route. And then the other thing was, is we just had Azalea AI'd. It's that been, as of recording the video, it's been a week and a half that she's been AI'd. When the, this podcast comes out, it'll be like two weeks that she's been AI'd. So if the AI didn't take, we were going to use George to rebreed her and not have to go the AI route again. Yeah. You know, they say death comes in it's threes. Hard when you make... no, don't say that. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go check on my animals after we finish this recording. <laughs> right. I know. So <clears throat> I was on Instagram today. So we got our semen from Reverend's Farm. I think I don't know if she's in North Carolina or Virginia, but they're A two A two grass fed dairy. They ha- I don't know where they were having a bull transported to, but they had a were having a bull transported, and the 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 transporter I think it said like the transporter usually checks the doors and stops every hour. He did, and then twenty minutes later, after one of his checks, somehow the trailer door opened when they were on Interstate forty, and the bull fell out of the trailer onto the interstate. It's alive. They had to, Jeez. I don't know what they had to do to it, but I guess it was scunned up and cut up. Wow. Dude. So maybe that's the third one, and you're all set, Ben. <laughs> Man, that's, that's like so crazy. 
animal transport worst nightmare right there. Right. Oh, that's tough. You gotta, yeah. You really gotta figure out why you want to do this. <laughs> yep. We do. And then I'm like, oh, we're getting into breeding. You know, well, you, you guys breed pigs and everything. Then you got more of a chance of everything happening. Yeah. You know, we've had, I think the, you know, you have chickens die. That, that happens. I don't think it's as big of a deal because it's a small animal. We've had some stillborn goats being born. I don't think that's as big of a deal because usually, usually you have multiples where like a cow, you only have like one or a cow takes a lot longer too. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Bringing in animals, different ball game. So that's been my week. It's getting so do you, Did you say, I don't know if you said, but why were the cows out? You just. So we've been having them out on pasture. Um, so when we have got, them. When you said they got out. Well, he was. They, so George, when he got out, when he, whatever he did, he took the fence down. Oh, okay. So we just had him out. So they have like the big pasture area. Or not the big pasture area, but they have like a bigger fence. That's like four strands. And then we've been putting them out on pasture. That's just one strand and moving that around on grass. And then they he can move the one strand. Yeah, we move the one strand and we leave it. We've been leaving it connected to the main fence so they can get in and out for their water and get to the barn if they want to go in the run in and get out of the sun. So when we got home, we went out. I think we were home at like eight o'clock. Well, I must have been later than eight because it was dark. Um, and we didn't see them anywhere. So like, oh, they're sleeping out in pasture. We're not going to wake them. They'll come back, you know, in the morning or whenever they want. They'll go back in the barn. No big deal. But so he took down the single wire? Is that he what took he down did? the single wire, yep. Mm. It was around his foot. You know, like he must, he just went right through it. And then, so that was down on the ground. And then the other one was just roaming around eating grass all night. Mm. Freak accident. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's so like the people we got them from, they raise, I don't know how many they have right now, but they got a good sized herd of Highland cattle. And they just have their Highland cattle in a single strand fence that's, pro it's got to be maybe two feet or maybe three feet off the ground. It's low enough where you can step over it, just one strand. And that keeps their cows in all the time. It's like they don't, they're trained to the fence. They usually don't bother the fence. That's why I said it. I'm assuming it was the goose just because that goose was around. Yeah. Keep an eye out for that goose. Run that sucker out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I I don't know if the sing if the single goose because Gina looked it up and like goose usually aren't by themselves. So like its mate might have got sick or something. There was no nest around. Like it's not like there was babies anywhere. So we're not sure where that came from. Why you would just have a single goose and then where it went? Maybe it was a hit goose. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Did you have a goose in your yard the night you lost your sheep? No. No. <laughs> Not that I know of. <laughs> we'll start and we'll put it out to the internet and be like, have you seen this goose? Do you have unexplained animal deaths? You see, Wanted. Looks like a regular Canadian goose, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Taking out pastured yeah. livestock. He's tripping up animals. He's just sticking his foot out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> send them through the fences oh man so other than that Al other than that yep oh, that's, anything that's, else that's, no. anything positive <laughs> I, just, I guess I I the figured fish. I'd end with that versus starting off with that yeah okay. that's good <laughs> so yeah what have you been up to this week Ben uh, a lot and nothing at all is kind of what it feels like so I got that wood chipper right uh, I got a uh, Woodland Mills. It's a, what do they call it? A 6'8 is the size. So you can fit six inches by eight inches. Uh, so it's a, it's a good size wood chipper. It's got power in feed. You, you asked me when I told you about it last week, you know, what do I think about it? And I freaking love this thing. If it'll, if it'll fit under that roller, <laughs> that thing will chew it up. So I've I've probably chipped really? I don't know two truckloads worth of wood chips now, and it's just stuff that has just been bothering me that I've needed to chip. Uh, I the entire brush pile that we accumulated um, from these trees we took out to build our addition 
Um, mind you, that was like four trees, I think we took out and they're big trees. They're like 50, 60 feet tall trunks on them were like uh, a couple of them. The trunks were like 16 inches. So that's, that's a healthy oak tree. Well, the pile of brush was, I say, and so, they were oak. yeah, and they were oak. So this pile of brush was taller than I could lift with the tractor because I just kept on throwing brush and throwing brush. Well, I didn't want to leave it where it's at because it's kind of in a spot that I need. And so I got this wood chipper. Let's try it out. So we went down there and the first thing that I have chipped with that wood chipper is, uh, well, it's oak that's about four months dry now, six months, uh, yeah, closer to six months dry. Uh, so very, very hard stuff. Um, and that thing chewed it up like no problem. So chipped all that stuff. And then a couple trees that I've needed to take out, I've dealt with, um, just stuff like that. A lot of wood chipping. And so kind of how that's, that's worked around the schedule is I haven't like made a video about the wood chipper. Cause I kind of wanted to test it out and see if I like it. Um, this, you know, it's not a sponsored wood chipper or anything like that. So if it sucks, I'm going to tell you, uh, no, it's absolutely marvelous. <laughs> uh, uh, I would, I would give uh, Woodland Mills more of my money uh, if something happened to this one. Like, I love this thing. This is, it's like a dream wood chipper. I've always wanted nice. something like this. Um, so, yeah, I, now the problem is like, I need to get back to our building project, but it's starting to get hot. So like my enthusiasm for being out in the hot humidity is just, I have no enthusiasm. And so I'm like finding all of these other things that I can do. Well, I can't wood chip in the middle of the day because it's too blasted hot out there in the sun. Uh, so I'm like, I'm wood chipping in the morning and then I'm wood chipping in the evening and then, you know, whatever else during the day. Uh, I don't know. I may, I may go do some wood chipping after we're done here. I'm not sure, but, but it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like an addiction. Like, Oh, uh, I, I, there's a tree over here that like, I was walking the property line today going, you know what? This tree needs to go. This tree needs to go. I'd like to be able to get the golf cart through here so I could drive the property line, you know, that kind of stuff. It's have wood chipper That's awesome. will travel. So uh, yeah. other than how wood chipping hold, everything. How will the blades hold it up? So it, that would maybe be my one complaint is if you chip a really big log, like a six inch diameter log, you know, really any bigger than that, I'm going to cut it up for firewood anyways. So I don't need too much bigger of a wood chipper. Right. Um, the distance between the infeed roller and where the blades are is probably like four or five inches, something like that. And so if you're chipping a large log, when it is feeding into that, that blade, as soon as that roller drops off, all of a sudden there's nothing to push that last little section of log into the blades. And so it kind of bounces around and it's like, it's completely safe. Yep. You can just hear it. Like it's inside the chamber that's in between where the blades are and where the roller ends. Uh, well, what happens is sometimes those little pieces of log bounce around and then turn sideways. And then uh, mm -hmm. the blades are cutting you know, with the grain instead of across the grain. And so, you know, it's making chips and making chips and then you'll hear that thing start bouncing around and all of a sudden massive chunks of wood will come out of the chute. And they're just like, I don't know, have you ever seen how they make a uh, veneer, how they'll take a log and they, they roll the log against a blade and it just peels off a huge paper of wood. Uh, that's kind of what it does. And so you'll get these sheets of however big that chunk of wood was that come shooting out and like it's not a big deal they're not huge to the point where you have to pick them out of your nice fine wood chips but they will clog the chute if you know too many of them come in and the way i've the way i've found to combat that is right before you run out of wood feed it another piece of wood and that next piece of wood will push that chunk into the blade so you don't get that but Sometimes you don't have another piece of wood to feed it, so it happens, and then it doesn't clog up very often. Uh, but when it does, it's kind of a pain in the butt because you got to stop everything, turn everything off, and get a wrench and open the thing up and clean the chute out. But 
yeah, other than that, it's not really a big complaint. It's just kind of, you know, one of those weird things. I'm sure I'll figure out a workaround uh, the more I use it. We, uh, we finally cropped out our potatoes in the greenhouse uh, so we could uh, plant the rest of our stuff that we need to plant. Uh, I've, I've got this nursery of plants that are just withering away and dying up here on the, uh, the picnic table that it's all stuff that should have went out like a month ago. And I just haven't had the space to stick it in or I haven't had the time. So uh, this was Saturday, me and the boys, all of us, we went out like I, they were all kind of wandering around, not doing anything. It was like, I don't know, middle of the day and it was kind of hot, but Saturday was Saturday was a nice day. I was like, all right, all y'all come help me. I need help. We're going to pull some weeds and we're going to plant some stuff. So me and all four of the boys went out and we just attacked the garden. Uh, we planted out Brett's garden because Brett wanted a garden. So I gave him a huge plot. And so he needed help planting his. So we planted stuff out there. And then we came over to our garden and the greenhouse and uh pulled weeds we pulled out we had a whole bunch of radishes and stuff that needed to come out anyways because it was all bolted pulled all that stuff and stuck the rest of what we needed to plant in uh it's a very nice feeling like having the garden like done like i can walk away now there will be a little bit of weeding maybe some watering here and there but it's on autopilot until october i just have to harvest so it's it's a good feeling uh Potatoes. I don't know. I, it's the end of an experiment. So I figured I'd share some numbers. Um, we probably had a 40 foot, three 40 foot rows of potatoes in the greenhouse. Um, we planted them like March 1st, I think is technically when we planted them. Um, they were not done yet. We, uh, we pulled all these potatoes because we needed to plant other stuff in the greenhouse. Um, Got a fair amount of like really good potatoes. Uh, they're all, most of them are russets. Um, decent looking, uh, very delicious. The varieties we're growing. Oh gosh, I'd have to, I I have some, some more seed potatoes sitting next to me. I'd have to look at them. They're like caribou or something like that. They're, they're like a russet. Um, we got just shy of 60 pounds of potatoes out of these three 40 foot beds ish. Um, not the biggest haul for that size. We've, we've actually done like 200 pounds of potatoes out of the same amount of space before. Um, but I think it's because we, uh, we pulled them before they were ready. So basically these are called early potatoes, um, because they didn't cure in the ground. They won't keep as long. So it just means we have to eat more of them faster which I, I, I do believe we are up to the challenge and they're, they're freaking delicious. <laughs> uh, if you've, if you've never grown your own potatoes and like made stuff out of them, like we've been making potato chips, hash browns, uh, we call them country, country taters. You just cube up your potatoes. I don't think we've made French fries out of them yet, but I'm sure that's coming. Uh, Man, like there is no comparing fresh potatoes to store-bought potatoes. Like, I'm sorry. I've never had a potato from the store that is as buttery and as like velvety and tasty as fresh potatoes. So so would you grow them in the high tunnel again? Absolutely. Um, so I've got potatoes growing in various, various locations all over the property. Um, I, I would say a good example is... I had like all of the leftover seed potato that I planted in the greenhouse. I took them and stuck them in the Hugel mound down there at the bottom of the property. And the ones in the Hugel mound honestly have done better, but uh, sheer neglect. That, that's pretty much what the Hugel mound is. It's sheer neglect. If I have room, I will stick something in there. Other than that, like I don't really do anything to it. It's just a, it's like a compost heap built on a wood pile. Like it's just a, it's a cool experiment. Um, well, I noticed the other day, I didn't see one single uh, potato worm in the greenhouse. And the ones on the Hugel mound are being overrun by potato, potato worms or potato beetles or whatever they're called. 
the little orange things that can decimate your potato plants. Uh, so I don't know. We didn't have the pest pressure in the greenhouse, whereas the ones that were planted at the same time down in the, the dugout, um, those ones are getting annihilated by pests. So I don't know. Maybe it, maybe the greenhouse protected. I'm not sure. Um, I, I will say, like, they did so good, and they made it through frosts. Next year, I'm planting potatoes in January in the greenhouse. Like, I'm going to try it in January. Could you do some in the fall and get a second harvest out of the greenhouse? We probably could. I don't know. It, it all depends on how far along everything is. Uh, like, we're kind of growing a hodgepodge of stuff. You know, we've got our tomatoes in one side of the greenhouse, and then the other side is just whatever we stuck in. Um, I've got some random squash growing, some pumpkins. Uh, I've also got peppers in one part of the greenhouse. So it's just like, I don't know. I think at this point, I'm just kind of throwing stuff at the wall, seeing what sticks. Um, I think the peppers will actually do better in the greenhouse because it's so much hotter. Uh, if you want some good hot peppers, it's got to be hot. Yep. That's that's always what I've found. I don't know. If, uh, if the squash don't take over the greenhouse and the peppers are done by, oh, I don't know, maybe like September, uh, I'll absolutely stick some more potatoes in there. But we'll see. We'll find out. We got to play it by ear. That's good, man. It was cool. Uh, I there feel is... the same way about the cabbage in the greenhouse. You going to do it again? I think so. I mean, just I feel like there's less bug pressure in the greenhouse. It's kind of where I'm at. Now, I will say I've got some uh, <laughs> the, the squash beetles, man. The squash beetles are the bane of my existence. Uh, mm. I've got some squash that are, you know, I start yeah. them in the greenhouse and then I'm letting them, like I'm training them to sprawl out of the greenhouse. I did this last year with a, uh, a kakuzi gourd. Um, and this kakuzi, like it was insane how big it got. And so it was like, well, maybe I could do that with trombacinos. So I'm trying it this year. Well, like the summer is just getting going and, these trombocinos are just starting to put on fruit and we are already overrun with squash beetles. And I've tried everything. I've, I've tried pyrethrum. Uh, when I spray them with pyrethrum, they, the squash beetles just look up at me and raise their fist at me and just keep, keep on doing what they're doing. Um, I've tried the, is that all you got? Yeah, that's what it's like. I swear they look at me and just go, yeah, nice try. Um, uh, I tried, we've tried neem oil. <laughs> we've tried all of the homemade uh, stuff. I, I got nothing. Like the only thing I have left is fire. So like I'll go out there, I'll find the ones on the ground and I'll just torch <laughs> them with a blowtorch. But that's a lot of work, especially, you know, as we get further into yeah. summer, there's more and more squash beetles. And it's like, at some point I either have to get the gasoline to deal with them or I just, so here you go, squash beetles. Eat all my squash. I, I can't win. So maybe it's one of those things. You know, anybody who's like dealt with squash beetle pressure, if you have some organic spray that is not pyrethrum or neem oil or, you know, all the, the usual suspects, please shoot me an email. You can email, you know, the Holler Homestead email. It'll get to me. Uh, it's I'm pulling my hair out. Yes. And if you do share it on the podcast, Ben, <laughs> mention it. <laughs> if, if there is something, if someone's like, you know, there's a, there's a farmer that, that works, that lives here. Um, and I, I just made contact with a uh, month or two ago when I did the, uh, it was a, a grafting class. I went and did this grafting class. I think I talked about it on the podcast. This is like a month or two ago. And yeah. I, I asked them, I was like, Okay, like you're down the street from me. How do you deal with the squash beetles? And they just laughed. They're like, we haven't found an organic way to deal with them. We grow them under row cover until the plants are like pushing their way out of the row cover. Uh, and then we uncover them, let them set fruit, and then we just harvest what we get. Uh, my friend Casey, that's how he grows squash. He doesn't even try to deal with the squash bugs. He just covers everything up with you know row cover and when you know they've got good flour on them he pulls the row covers off and then it's just a race to the bottom so i i don't want to race to the bottom i want to i want to race to win yeah 
I guess you just grow more than what you need too, probably. I think what's funny is the the have squash you tried beneficial. Bug? So I have tried all sorts of stuff. Um, I don't think there's a beneficial bug that will eat the uh, the squash beetles. Um, if there is, mm-hmm. I mean, I know there's a few things. This is the struggle I'm I'm having. You can catch the the nymph stage of the bug. Um, that's usually where you have to catch it. Um, they have a soft body, so the the sprays, the organic sprays, will work on them, and then you can break the cycle. But man, it only takes one or two squash bugs mating and laying eggs all over your squash. You know, I've even gone out there with a piece of duct tape and yep. stuck all the eggs I can find on the leaves. But when you've got you know fifty, sixty plants that are you know a twenty foot spread, it's literally tens of thousands of leaves that you have to comb over like it would work on a on a backyard scale but we're not growing on a backyard scale you know this is a pretty large scale we're growing on so i'm i'm needing like almost a commercial scale way to deal with this there's a website that you can buy beneficial insects from i can't think of the name of it i'm just trying to see if i can find it online i can't find it because we got one year we got aphids and we got I'm trying to think what because honeybees won't go inside greenhouses so we had an issue with cucumbers not getting pollinated and we didn't get the cucumbers that don't need to be pollinated so we ended up getting some kind of i don't know if it was bumblebees or not because bumblebees will stay in a greenhouse where honeybees won't and then that pollinated the, the cucumbers but i'm trying to think if they sold anything any kind of bug that would eat the squash beetles or not so there's a there's a place that i've gotten beneficial uh garden bugs um and they sell like i've I've been over everything that this place i buy from sells they sell green lace bugs ladybugs um gosh what else a couple others i've bought i've i've done the beneficial nematodes before um to try to deal with the japanese beetles yep and i mean I think it works, but it just depends. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, as far as I know, the only thing that eats uh, squash beetles are birds, um, and then wasps will eat their uh, their the nymph stage of the bug. But it's like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, great ducks. I, I, ducks. You know what? The chickens and the ducks <laughs> they they don't eat them. Uh, I've I've taken squash bugs and offered them to the chickens, and I think because they stink so bad, yeah. the chickens are like, "Yeah, heck no, I ain't eating that stinky yeah. bug." Same with a duck. Yeah, That's I'll it. eat your plant. I'll eat your plant first before I eat that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll they'll knock the bug off the plant yeah. as they eat the plant. Yeah. Something I think is really interesting is the squash that have come up voluntarily next to the chicken coop. The chickens can't eat the plant. But there's also no squash bugs on it. So I don't know if maybe it's like a, an authority thing. The squash bugs leave that plant alone because it's next to the chicken coop. I don't know. That's just something I've noticed. Have you ever tried saving seeds from the squash by the chicken coop and plant those the following year and see if in your greenhouse or wherever you're planting squash and see if those are bothered by? That's uh, that's what we're growing this year. We are We're in the... The middle of that experiment, okay. I saved. I saved a whole bunch of the squash. Like we got, we got some uh, Kushaw squash that came up voluntarily next to the chicken coop that were like thirty pounds, like huge okay. squash. And so I've planted wow. those in the greenhouse. These are part of you know this this year's crop because they did so good. They were so big, and the ones that are coming up in the greenhouse are getting overrun. So I don't know. There goes that idea. The only other thing I've ever heard is if you had healthy soil or like some like there's something missing that that plant needs. Yep. I've also heard that. And that's why that. the bugs come. Like I wonder if that's why Jason's cabbage cabbage didn't get overran by the cabbage bugs because his whatever the cabbage want is in that soil so yep. it can defend itself or whatever they do against the worms. Yeah, that that's like 100% true right there is if your soil is healthy and your plants are healthy then the pests will leave 
your plants alone. And that's something we've struggled with is, you know, soil health and plant nutrition since we got here. Like that has been the biggest struggle. Yeah. Other than that, you know, it's kind of the, this is what we're dealing with right now. So how do we deal with it? You know, the crazy part is, is what is by your chicken coop. I'm assuming you have that compost in your greenhouse. That's just kind of weird. About the only thing I can think of is I noticed that the chickens scratch a lot of dirt, like compost out of the chicken coop through the, the hardware cloth and it gets all over that plant. So maybe the squash beetles don't like all the dust. Like maybe it's something that simple. I've heard you can use diatomaceous oh, earth on them. I think that's the only thing I haven't tried is diatomaceous earth. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll try that. Maybe, maybe they just don't like dust. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> your chickens might've gave you your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's about it for me. Right on, man. So we're about an hour. Yeah, sorry about your cow, Al. Your oh, your, your bull. I think the internet just died. I appreciate everyone listening and watching. And we'll see you guys next week. Have a good week. Talk to you guys later.